Hello, and welcome to our artist panel for the Querida Atelier, which was led by artist curator Delila Paulo Mendez. My name is Karen Mary Davalos, and I am the professor and chair of the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And I'm also a board member at Self Help Graphics since 2012. Because my research is grounded in cultural anthropology, when I think of questions about art, I always begin with the artists. I want to know what they have to say. And so it is with great pleasure that I moderate the 58th Atelier entitled Querida, a Spanglish word that acknowledges the queer and dear in Spanish querida of our communities. Artist Delila Mendez was the curator for Self-Help Graphics' first queer Latina-focused printmaking atelier. Also with us, we have Trenely Clover Garcia, Angelica Bracera, and Cynthia Velasquez. I also want to acknowledge Pamela Chavez, the fifth member of the Querida Atelier. As moderator of the panel, I'll ask the artists to introduce themselves before we start in a conversation. And of course, I want to begin with the curator, Delila. So please introduce yourself to the audience and then pass the microphone to the next artist. Um, hi, thank you. It's very, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I look forward to this conversation. Uh, my name is Dalila Paola Mendez. Um, I was uh, honored to be asked to curate this atelier. Um, and also as, as an artist, one of the participating artists. Um, and so my work is very much like I do painting, uh, printmaking, uh, murals. I've done film and photography. So I have both a public practice. So I work a lot with youth um, and community members doing murals or uh, right now I'm working on a mental health workshop with youth in South LA. Um, and so my art really is about um, like my own explorations of ancestry, um, different ancestral backgrounds, especially because my family is very diverse with like Central American, uh, Middle Eastern, uh, Filipinos. So I feel like a lot of my work really looks and delves into the commonalities and a lot of the shared um, wisdoms and knowledge of our indigenous ancestors and just my indigenous background. And so uh, a lot of my work looks at that. And I feel like it's really important to work with uh, youth and to really share art artwork with them and for them to <clears throat> to share their stories through art making practices. So, um, because I think it's very important, like being a youth, uh, it was not very um, accessible to see artwork and artists that look like me, um, and especially as a queer artist and a woman of color that I feel like it's really important to have visibility and to work with youth to empower them to like, I mean, they have the power themselves, but to really give them the voice and for them to explore their creativity and to like, really support that communal aspect of community art making. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, share and let Angelica Becerra share about her art practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dalila. I'm happy that we're all here. Uh, my name is Angelica Becerra. My pronouns are she, hers. And I am both an artist and a scholar. So I'm currently a PhD candidate at UCLA in the Department of Chicana, Chicano and Central American Studies. Um, my work, both my research and my practice artistically are about community making in the digital. So I look at how artists are using digital tools, not just the software, but also after the 21st century, how we've really uh, created community online and offline. Um, my practice was really started by, I come from a family of artisans in Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, I immigrated to LA when I was 10. And ever since then, I've really carried that tradition of, you know, there's woodworkers in my family, there's crafters. Um, so that kind of relationship to studio, to practice was really instilled in me from a very young age, just seeing people in my family have a studio practice. 
Um, and now, uh, you know, my work really took a shift. So I was always a painter. I primarily dealt with um, acrylic and watercolor. And I switched completely to watercolor in my last five years of practice. Um, I collaborated with uh, the Palestinian Solidarity Movement here in Los Angeles. And that really shifted my practice. So I have always done portraiture, but I started to do graphics in the service of a social movement. Um, and that really shifted how I dealt with visuals. And so after coordinating national campaigns visually for a Palestinian organization, I really started to think about art with a message and how artists make a conscious choice to be politically involved in social movements and how they are sometimes, I would say, some of the most valuable players in those movements. Uh, even though they don't get that credit sometimes. So yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at right now. I, you know, primarily do portraiture, but deal with commissions with community organizations. Uh, I recently uh, collaborated with the United um, LA Teachers Union. So uh, they had a strike recently and I was one of the artists that created some images for them to march with. So uh, my practice is kind of varied now, especially digitally. Uh, my work kind of goes and goes wherever it can. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you for having us. I'm gonna pass it on to Cynthia. Hi there, thank you Angelica for passing it along. Uh, my name is Cynthia Velasquez. Uh, I was born to a Chilean mother and Guatemalan father, but raised mostly Chilean. Uh, language plays a big role in my work, um, mostly, because it's part of my, my thinking. Um, I studied fine arts and gender ethnic multicultural studies at Cal Poly Pomona before receiving uh, my master's in the School of Critical Studies at CalArts. Uh, my work reimagines home as a space shaped by queer diaspora and memory. I work with a lot of spatial reimagining, um, a lot of thinking around that. Uh, Part of my work in, in film too, and that's how I met Dalila, um, has influenced a lot of my thinking. Uh, my work reimagines home as a space shaped by queer diaspora, like I mentioned. Uh, and in that spatial reimagining, I'm influenced by a frugal use of culturally reflective materials, AKA, I didn't have enough money growing up, so I had to be creative with the work that I had. Uh, my mom often would buy me books, um, that from the secondhand store that had to do with like found objects. I would I would go search for rocks and paint them. Um, I was really into that and I was really grateful for that. Um, at the moment, I wanted something else. I wanted like professional stuff, but uh, I am very grateful to have learned that frugality, that to value that and be creative with that. Um, so such reimagining focuses on controlling like specific aesthetics of the home. Uh, we had a lot of rocks <laughs> in my house, um, rocks that honored uh, the plains of uh, the Chilean landscape. Um, lapis lazuli was something we wore. Uh, so through that, uh, observing that aesthetic and being influenced by that aesthetic, uh, and also storytelling, song, scents, the smell of foods. I develop a visual element toward remembering something. So um, even though I didn't really experience the military coup that happened in Chile while my mom was there, her stories grounded some, some of it for me. Um, it is one of the main reasons why my mom traveled over here and one of the main reasons why my father uh, came to Los Angeles um, because of war uh, and generational trauma. So in this way of me like remembering, it's a sense of control. So the sense of order, routine and process, gestural repetition in storytelling performs as a protection from that generational trauma. Um, so I'm like thinking heavily of that and trying to heal from that as well. Uh, so my work ultimately aims to examine and disrupt a dysfunction associated with those cultural objects uh, that shape my family memories because again of war, immigration, and toward a sense of, of comfort. Um, a lot of the mediums that I use are found objects, if not in my actual piece, uh, a replica of it. Um, 
photography is a main part of my work too, not in the use of it, but in the, um, the use of the actual print of photography. My parents owned um, a, f a photography store in Highland Park before, well, I was already born, but before in the 80s. So they would do a lot of like work for the community. Um, uh, and there's just huge archives of photography in my house. Um, a lot of it was given away, but what I have is what I use to influence my, my work. Um, the Recently I finished a residency at The Reef in Los Angeles through CalArts. Uh, with five other um, artists, we shared a, a studio space, and I was able to showcase new new work, and that was replicas of uh, and reimagined homes um, from those images. Now, I will pass the the camera to Clover. Um, Clover, um, from Los Angeles, South Central. I mo well, I work with different mediums. Um, from acrylic, oil, uh, watercolor, I do photography, and I also work with youth. I mainly work with youth, I want to say. Um, most of my projects are community-based and um, just have like more youth involvement. Uh, my last like few projects, um, right now I'm currently working on one with um, with the Youth Justice Coalition. I'm doing a mural with another artist inside their um, their space, which is a community center and um, a continuation school. And my last two projects, I did two murals inside um, East Lake, the Central Juvenile Hall. And I'm part of two collectives, Ni Santas and Crew Native. So I'm also a sign painter. I went to Trade Tech. I took a two year course with Doc, the sign graphics program. Um, and I did that like 2014. Yeah, 2014. Like, and I've been painting since then. I luckily like halfway through my training or through the course, I, I met my mentor where she brought me out and actually took me out to the field and showed me how to get work and how to ask for it because at, um, at the school they teach you like one or two lines but they don't make you really do the the footwork to get out there and get your customers they encourage you to do that but they don't really teach you how to do that and this person blossom she really took me under her wing and she she would force me to get out of the car and tell people she would be like go offer him a sign like go she would make me do it till i got comfortable enough and then I just started doing it on my own. But she gave me my first job, which was like off of, it was in commerce, like off of Slauson and like, I forgot the other street. But it's like a really big pink building. It's like a beauty supply and warehouse. And um, I incorporate my sign painting in my work too. I find that I do do that a lot. And I also incorporate nature. Thank you. Thank you everyone for those introductions. It was so inspiring to hear this rich family backgrounds and the way um, you're thinking about your own family's experiences um, and how it moved you forward in, in the art world. I wanna begin by asking Dalila what was her vision for the atelier and um, how she shared that vision with the artists? Um, yeah, so my vision for this was really to get a very diverse group of uh, queer women of color to participate in this, especially I think not only like, um, because as Latinx folks, we, we come from different geographies. It's a, it's a large area. Um, and so I feel like it's really important not only to like highlight the different geographies, but also our geographies in LA because I feel like, or in California, we should say, because Pamela comes from the Bay Area, but she lives here now in LA. Um, Angelica, you were like out in Torrance, right? Um, and then Cynthia is in Glendale or she grew up in Glendale and then Clover's South LA 
and then I'm in kind of like Echo Park, Northeast LA. So I think, you know, in different ways and also in the artwork that we do, I feel like it was just really, I wanted to show the different techniques, the styles and the messages and the type of work that all of these mujeres did that I felt like was really, um, just like a really good breath of dope artists and then what they could execute in silk screen. So that was really, really um, important to me. And then also like looking at queer love or just being queer, like it's not, I mean, I think in a lot of times we get presented these dichotomies and there, it's not that, like we all have different experiences. And I feel like as a queer artist, we don't have to do work that's queer. Like it can be very different. So I feel like the gamut of what these amazing artists could contribute to like showing what it is to just be queer. Like, what does that look like? So I think I gave them really like open questions to kind of ponder and then use whatever they felt like really talk to them or what they wanted to express. They had that like, um, just that openness to do that and to express themselves in the ways that they felt were true to them and what they wanted to like put down on paper and in this process of silk screen um, or stereograph. And so I think in that process, um, a lot of them have had some experience with uh, stereograph or silk screen printing, but I think this really took it to the next level. And uh, there was a lot of different layers of colors. So we kind of had more freedoms in that. Like usually the ateliers have been about the first one I did was only, I only could use six colors or actually five colors. I was granted one extra color. But, um, and so within this, it was able to build. And so just watching every artist's process of like how they built those layers, how the layers communicated with each other on the paper, I think it was a really interesting process to see them um, kind of like problem solve and like use their skills to like figure out how to do that. But then also, I guess also things that they hadn't planned kind of came out of it. So it was a really interesting experience to see everybody's process and some, you know, um, yeah, it was really great to see. I would come in and out to see how that process was going um, and to work with uh, Dewey. Most of everybody worked with Dewey or Andy. So um, it was, yeah, so that process was really great. I think it was just like a really great way to see what these amazing artists had come up with was really um, at the end really great to see. Thank you. Let's let's dive in further to that question about process and I want to start with Cynthia because you mentioned that you have an interest in language. Um, you mentioned your your grounding in a home aesthetic and reimagining the home. I was wondering if you could start by talking about the title of your work and then tell us about the process, how you came to this image. Yeah, of course. Uh, so my, the title of my piece is Los Guia, and the way it's spelled is L-X-S space Guia, um, guide in Spanish, G-U-I, uh, accent on the I-A. Uh, so the L-X-O-S, uh, you, you pronounce it like Los, uh, in Spanish, as we know, it's very gendered, uh, and I wanted to eliminate that for my my piece uh, to honor gender fluidity. Um, I think that's something that I'm personally always faced with, um, and I wanted to translate that in my title. Uh, the title of pieces are very important for me. Um, sometimes they're comical, sometimes they're not, sometimes they have a greater purpose um, to serve as a guide uh, to see this piece like the artist saw it um, in, in conversation with how people see it um, or could see it. Uh, language in general for me, growing up in LA but not really speaking Mexican Spanish, um, which is something that I think is more popular in Los Angeles being that the majority of immigrants and descendants of immigrants are Mexican. Um, I grew up speaking Chilean Spanish and for those of you who are familiar, it's very fast, it's different. Um, I go home and I speak with, I speak to my mom with it and her being a white Latina, it's like very different. Um, an association with the Chilean Spanish. Um, I'm not perceived automatically as Chilean, so when I speak Spanish, it's different. And also, the Spanish that I speak at home is very much from like the 60s and 70s, from when my mom left. So 
the, the dialect changes, the colloquialisms change, and I'm still using, um, uh, like, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, informal language that my mom would use back in the 60s now. So with my cousins, like I use those words and they're like, oh, that's just so outdated. But um, that's telling of like how home is such a marker, um, such a, a, a foundational space. So that to me inspired me to play with language as I go. Do you want to tell us about the piece? Los Guía? Sure, uh, I can describe it. Uh, Los Guía uh, is a 12 plus color print. It uh, is a fusion, fusion of images uh, of the American buffalo, the pigeon, and uh, there's a woman in the middle there. Um, let me pull it up quick. Uh, so this piece is a um, tracing uh, enlargement of a drawing that I did with color pencil. And that original piece had actually like all these, all women. Um, there was no pigeon, uh, no animals in it. And I decided to change it up because at the time I was very involved with understanding the four directions through a, a Native American perspective. So the elders represented by the, um, the image to the left, the buffalo, that is the uh, direction of the north, um, symbolizing elders, ancestors. And then the pigeon symbolizes um, what I considered um, the, uh, the urban life, um, uh, the the flights the urban flights living in the city, and that pigeon is re it recur it's like recurrent in all of my work um, somehow it's just like a little stamp of like I acknowledge the pigeon right um, and then the images of the overlapping women um, I I aim to highlight like this mo this moment this momentous like realization of being in spirit being connected to ancestors um, and this piece was also really influenced by a lot like a lot of intersections queer love um, it was influenced by the passing of my father which is also a huge marker of my work that I don't often talk about um, in detail it happened when I was five years old and it changed our entire lives so that was also an homage to him and um, him being everywhere like he shows up with the number 14. So um, he shows up with it with my birthday, March 14, my sister's birthday, April 14, and his birthday, June 14. So things like show up and I know that that's him, right? So for me, uh, that moment that happened that is so informative, I wanted to display in this piece. Um, and the, also the different colors, I didn't feel so stressed out about picking the exact colors I wanted to I really let myself go with that one and that's pr pretty much the first time I've ever done that it's a huge deal for me because I'm always led by color um, but I was very interested in using warm colors I didn't want to use any black but at the end of it I did because you couldn't see <laughs> most of the images uh, in the piece so uh, Dewey really influenced that he's like you should just use black like I was trying to argue myself out of it but um, the black really made everything come together, which um, I love. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I yeah. want to turn now to Angelica um, because she also uses the human figure in her image, in her print. And I've wondered if you could tell us more about your interest in, in portraiture and mm -hmm. how that influenced the process for this um, serigraph. Sure. Um, so this is a 15 color. I can't believe it was 15 <laughs> layers. Definitely not at start with that. Um, I started doing portraiture pretty much since I was very little. Um, I was very lucky to have uh, an aunt who taught me portraiture. She was a life figure uh, drawer. Um, she, her job was to do replicas of religious paintings back in Jalisco because 
most restaurants wanted, you know, a copy of the Madonna for their uh, entryway and they couldn't afford the real thing. So um, she was very used to painting these very beautiful kind of highly detailed uh, Madonnas for work and she was my babysitter. So <laughs> um, she kind of decided, you know, to kill two birds with one stone and get her painting out of the way and have me painting next to her. So portraiture was really kind of my first thing that I learned how to do and I just kept going. Um, in my work though, in the piece for the atelier, it's a self-portrait um, that is based on a reference photo of a selfie of me, uh, which is very millennial. And I wanted to just incorporate the portrait because I think, especially for my piece, you know, it's titled 1-800-PAY-FM. And I identify as a femme, uh, meaning that I present my gender in a very high feminine way. Um, and I value femininity, not just in myself and my presentation, but in other people. And yeah, I think that piece, you know, it started, I love that Cynthia talked about letting go of the color, because for me, it was a little bit of the opposite experience. I couldn't let go <laughs> um, of color. I was sort of obsessed with uh, the color mixing, the color choices. And then towards the end, actually one of the colors in the print that shows my letting go and my dewy influence is the lilac shirt. So that was supposed to be, you know, I came in with an image very firmly saying, this portrait is gonna have a forest green shirt on, I already know. And then as I went through the process, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna mix a color that I've never used before and I'm gonna try to see how it looks. And that sort of experimentation and that like looseness in the studio is really, largely in part for, from Dewey, uh, where he said, just mix a color that you want to like see and figure it out. It's not a commitment, you know, just, you know, mix it and see what happens. And it was probably my favorite color of the whole print that really pulled it together. Um, that lilac blouse that um, was completely an accident. <laughs> so um, yeah, my portraiture really, I think for me, it's important to see the faces of those that we need to know more about. You know, my whole practice is about painting portraits of women of color activists that we need to know about. And so I, it was really important for me to have the human figure and to have someone directly looking. I'm very into self-portraits for that reason, just like that direct confrontation with the viewer. Um, I love it. So it was an opportunity to grow um, definitely through the process of it. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Angelica. I want to turn now to Clover. Um, your piece involves human figures, but it is largely a cityscape. I wonder if you can comment on the work, the process, your choice of line and color. Okay, so yeah, it's pretty much my environment, what I grew up seeing daily. And I grew up next to, next to the Metro Blue Line and, um, and the Union Pacific track. Like there's two, three tracks. So I, like I hear the train whenever it passes by, our house shakes, um, the the bigger trains, like I hear them at night and it's something I got used to and I don't mind it anymore and I enjoy hearing them. But um, reimagining it, I really wish that that industrial area was just green. I, I feel like um, even with parks, like there's so much that can be done, like gardens, community gardens like it's just space that's not really being used or just occupied and reimagining it i wish that everything would be green instead of the industrial space it is and so with my layers i think it was about 12 colors that i used and i mixed all of them so it's all custom colors i i try to do that with most of my work um, just so I know, like, it's, it's really original. I feel that that's, like, my, my signature, just trying to be, like, as original as I can with, like, um, from using, um, uh, I would say, like, I guess just the, the flat colors that they have, even if it's just a little tint of, like, other colors, I would still mix it. And, Originally, I had way more colors in mind, but I, of course, I didn't really think about the process of having to burn a screen for every color. So I slowed it down a little bit. And even then, I still wanted to do a few translucent colors and like different patterns on it. 
because I wanted it to be a little more psychedelic and um, just more of a like a dream like like is it real is it not um, kind of feel to it I feel like with my work I everything's like pretty much just surreal and yeah I can see the it hovers on the surreal with the clouds outside of the color frame raining on this south central landscape uh and you talked before about this uh spacecraft right tell yeah. us more about where those uh symbols come from in your family stories okay so um from a younger age i think that my like we've always been fascinated with my older brothers and and my sister like just looking up um aliens and like different life forms and different phenomena so um it grew from there and then also my mom telling us the story that her dad would always tell her that um during the summer these spaceships would come and land like on certain sides like of the mountains where they were living and i thought that that was really interesting because we like she didn't she didn't like mention that when we were younger but we were already into into it and then after she mentioned that i just found it more like um exciting or just more intriguing like wow like um he's blind so it was just more interesting that he said that like how how does he know that they're landing here if he can't even see them right so I just thought that was pretty cool. I want to turn now, of course, to Dalila's print, Corazon del Agua, um, a wonderful contrast in so many ways to Clover's work. I mean, they both are natural scapes, um, just Clover's is urban. Um, but I'm also really struck by a different kind of composition that is so much more balanced there's this, there's a serenity in the way your composition, Dalila, um, uses symmetry. I wonder if you could talk about your process and the work. Yeah. Um, so this piece, I think it's very, so it's Corazon del Agua. Um, again, like kind of Cynthia mentioned as well, like the four directions. So this is, was really about water. And I think water gives life. And I feel like queer love gives me life. And so, it also was a way that I, in my work, I celebrate a lot black and brown bodies because I feel like a lot of times, especially women, like we're killed a lot. There's a lot of violence against women. And I just feel like the woman's body is a temple. So it was this celebration of women um, or the female body, but also how she represents the earth and nature. So there's this like, a rebirth, there's death, there's a, a regeneration, there's a life that it gives us not only like for our day-to-day -day use, um, but also as a queer woman of color, like I feel like for me when I came out and was able to speak my truth of being queer, that really honoring the female body like a temple and that love isn't such, like I was back, cause I came back, I came out like back in the 90s, which was like really, not very much there wasn't very much talked about it was still hush hush and it was still me i was trying to figure it out because there wasn't really anything that i could grasp onto so it was like you know reading this bridge called my back so it's like literature and other things and writers really gave me the vocabulary to talk about my process and my coming out and so this piece is really like honoring the beauty the the sacredness of the of the, of the female body and and how it gives birth, how it gives life, and also how spiritual I feel like love can be. It's a, it's a spiritual act. And so, um, and I think, you know, with also with water, like the way that we get symmetry in our world is through water, you know, because water it has in its molecular body is symmetrical, right? So that's where all this symmetry comes from. And so I feel like it's just a really honoring. And then I think because also as well, I was raised by my grandmother and interesting enough my grandmother was passing kind of like we were going i was walking with her through this um time when i was making this print 
So it also, for me, was a way to, I grew up in a very matri, my family on my, my grandmother's side, on my mom's side is matriarchal. So my grandma was like the nucleus and was the whole of my family. So for me, it was also like just really representing the beauty of the matriarch and the importance of it. And I feel like the violence that women, like that can be directed at women is also the violence that is directed at the earth. And I feel like they're very, it's the same kind of thing that's happening. So for me, it was really about um, sharing the beauty, the divinity and the, the amazingness of like the, the feminine. So the lotus is there also represents in like Buddhism and then like also in Hindu religion, like about rebirth and it comes from the mud into the light so into consciousness so there's a lot of spiritual and a lot of like indigenous ancestral knowledge that's in there and it's i do it very like through my color or then through the symbols and that piece was about 16 layers of color as well so <laughs> that one was just a real building and building um so yeah it, it's such a joy to hear each of you talk about the um the layers and, and colors and the struggle and the, and the way you resolve things. It, it's, it's very inspiring to hear uh, our artists at Self-Help Graphics really tackling some very difficult technical issues and, and the collaborative process working with your master printer, whether it's Dewey or, or one other person, um, I mentioned another name, but that, that collaboration then I think with your curator stepping in and, watching you in the process probably also informed um, the creative moment. Uh, it's, it's extremely inspiring. I wanna make sure that we do value and honor and give some space to um, uh, Pamela Chavez who couldn't be with us today because her work also speaks to spiritual, um, a, a longer heritage going farther back and the earth and also the technique that you see in that print, Valor, um, a kind of translucent quality. But uh, let's open it up for a closing question. Um, what are you doing now or what are you doing next? What techniques are you working with and exploring now, um, especially with these difficult times? You know, How are you pushing your artistic practice? And perhaps if you have an idea if you were allowed to design an atelier, what would that be? And I start with uh, Cynthia. Sure. Uh, well, I'd like to tap into both questions. They're both related. Uh, what I'm doing now, I am rethinking. I'm currently in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I am very lucky to have a studio space that is my garage <laughs> uh, and I've transformed it um, into a space where I can think about this stuff. Um, right now I'm thinking about documenting various attachments to memory through objects. So still with that um, connection to objects, um, specifically culturally related objects, um, I'm still using my family's archive, identifying and researching the origin stories of specific objects. And this is through just conversations with my mom and my sister um, and family that have been long, um, that are far away in Chile. Um, the majority of my, my dad's family are still in um, Los Angeles. Um, and the process of choosing these objects is really based off of that um, and trying to document those stories, the oral stories that we often are, um, that we often hear a lot um, and repeat. And also seeing that manifest within me, being so far away from home. This is, I'm the first person out of my entire family um, to move away from Los Angeles. And I'm starting to, repeat a lot of what like my mom is doing um, or what my mom has taught me. And um, some of it is not so good and a lot of it is really good. And so those strong attachments to movement and how they repeat is something that I'm really obsessed with. Um, it's something that I want to like slow down, right? And that's part of um, the aim I had with Los Guia. I was 
obsessed with wanting to know um, my native ancestry. There's no documentation, um, and I'm still trying to figure out if there is. Um, but I know, I know that uh, I uh, I have uh, native ancestry. I don't know where they come from, really, somewhere in in Central America. Um, but that attempt to like reclaim um it's complicated it's complicated because i'm reclaiming something that has been lost um through something that isn't lost i i tried i tried to connect um with living native americans um who practice this and specifically who identify as queer so or, or two-spirited um th those are two differing but um, slowly merging identities uh, and their information, right? So that connection to creator, that connection to prayer, um, that connection to your elders and how we can find that space as a true healing space. Um, I was told by one of my teachers that like my artwork, my connection to making is my healing space. So in that healing space, I try my best to give it my all and be in it and, in my all, um, my full self. So that um, presents a lot of challenges when you're far from home, when you are feeling at a loss, but also when you're feeling when time is not an issue anymore. Um, so uh, in that discovery or that exploration really um, uh, of going back to my family archive, identifying and also setting up my space with sound, sense, all the all the things that have to do with aesthetics, I create my own politic, uh, and so in my own politic, I'm I'm um, trying to honor all six senses um, while I'm creating work. Wow, that sounds exciting. So, so connecting that to an, uh, my own atelier um, or uh, an idea for an atelier is to honor folks who are gender fluid, um, particularly folks who identify as trans. Um, so what does that look like? We had that conversation with Dalila um, back when we were doing the atelier and, and we were curious to know like how, if folks, if trans artists were, would be even interested um, and if they were, how do we uplift them? How do we celebrate them? Thank you. And Clover, what are you working on now and what are you thinking of next? Or if you had an idea for an atelier, what would it be? Probably, um, I would say having to do with the future, like um, I guess the artist's future and, and try to, um, to of course get to the audience and have them thinking about their future and their intentions just more on a self-care tip like what what would their future look like or what what they want their future to be like with themselves or connection with themselves just to get everyone i feel like going like i feel like not enough people really sit down and think about um what healthy ways they can deal with their traumas and heal so i think that i would want to get into that or have like highlight that and right now i'm working on a linal cut um i want to do more of that i feel that it it's really relaxing or at least something that i haven't done enough of and i would like to gain more experience and I'm working on a mural uh, with another artist. She, um, well, her name's Erica. She's also from the same neighborhood and she's brown. Um, I think, I think that's it, just on, on the mural. I do, well actually, I'm working to getting my own space because I'm so used to working out of self-help and now it's closed, so I feel like, damn, like I really should get my own space. And I mean, the backyard's fine, but I think just to be proper, just indoors. Um, Angelica? Uh, what am I working on now? Well, I'm finishing my dissertation. 
Uh, so that's <laughs> the one thing that's happening. But as part of my dissertation, I did do a series of portraits, um, basically to reciprocate the labor that the artist who I interviewed did. Um, so I have two more left out of the series of six that I have to finish this quarter. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about feminists. I, I did, um, I didn't realize until I did this atelier that a lot of what I talk about is labor, both seen and unseen. So I really want to, you know, offer if there's ever a chance to do an atelier to do it around labor, both seen and unseen, um, and how artists uh, interpret that. Because I, I think for me as a, as a femme, queer femme, I never really thought about emotional labor until it kind of started to burgeon in the digital and people started to critique it. And, and that really created this piece. And so uh, I think that kind of prompt would be really interesting to see how other people interpret. Uh, but yeah, uh, other than that, I, I really want to experiment with gouache. I've sort of had a love affair with it uh, and then put it down because it's a little bit difficult to work with. <laughs> um, I'm not used to opaque ink. So I think that for me, it's really interesting going from watercolor to gouache and um, I'm playing around with it in quarantine, you know, nothing serious, but uh, really excited to have some time to just experiment and be gentle with myself. Well, when I see the technical mastery that comes forth in this atelier, um, I'm very confident that each of you will be able to tackle and resolve whatever technical challenges you give yourself aesthetically, artistically. I'm going to leave the closing comment to the curator of the 58th Atelier, Queerida, Delila. What inspired you while you were leading this workshop? Um, I think for me, I think because um, I was given the opportunity in 2013 to do an uh, to participate in an atelier uh, that Victoria Delgadillo was curating at that time. And it was looking at um, weaving our stories. And so I think as self-help graphics, I think also for myself, self-help graphics was the first place that actually I was able to show my work. So it was like also another coming out space for me. And yeah, and so I think self-help for me really was a really important place that I had exposure to as a high school student. So I was like, oh, wow, they're like Chicano, Chicana, at that time, we're like Chicano, Chicana artists in LA that I had never heard of. And so it really made a huge difference in my life as a high school student. And then to come after, what, like five years later to then show my work there um, and then also get the opportunity to try doing a silkscreen print because at that time I had, and I was still doing like a lot of film production design. Um, and so for me, I guess too, it's like this atelier gave me the opportunity to like invite, again, just really amazing uh, artists. And then for them as well to get the chance to work in a professional studio, to work with a master printer um, and to like open the door for other mujeres to come along and also be able to like learn a new technique to like take it to the next level and, and bring us together in, in a process way. Because I think also as artists, a lot of times we're very isolated in our own studio practice. Um, you know, and sometimes we do have public practices as well, but a lot of times for us to get our ideas down, we kind of have to go in, you know, inward and like research, we do our processes, we, we work. And so this way, the atelier, which I really love, and I think, you know, we're also looking at self-help, like ways that we can expand the atelier is like to work with each other and really look into the process of how we do that and share the information with each other. Because also I think, a lot of us are self-taught artists. Some of us do go to school, which is also, and I think that's the beauty of self-help. It also has a lot of self-taught artists, people from community. You have multi-generations and that's not really seen in a lot of places. So just to have this like multi-generational spot and when you're at self-help, you're working, you're gonna run into other artists that come into the studio, not so much anymore because you can't be in the studio when people are working, but like when you come out of the space, you'll meet other artists and you'll see their work and you get inspired by their techni like their technical, but also the stories. Like it's our oral story then becomes like actual physical stories within an art form. And like, I think, you know, art for us also is therapeutic. It's, it's ways that we can like work with, you know, like Cynthia talked about home or like, 
you know, seen and unseen labor or like living in industrial areas of LA and you talk about that, like there's just all these things that we're able to talk about in our pieces that really pushes our work as artists and it very much supports each other. So it makes that container to hold our journey as artists amongst a space that is supportive. It's really, um, you know, and also like really asking us to think about things critically and looking at issues of social justice issues, like about being immigrant communities and how that looks very different for all of us. And so, you know, being the 58th is such an honor. And then also to be at Self Help, which is such a space that helps community. It really brings a lot of artists together that we don't really have that space anywhere else. You know, Clover talking about like being able to go to Self Help and work and have space as a studio because a lot of us, our studio space is in our home and little corner we can carve out for ourselves. So I think in that way, um, it was just really important to bring together a group and to have that space. And, you know, an honor for me now to be like, oh yeah, I've, I've been able to like curate and do my humble way of curating and bringing together all these amazing, amazing artists has been really um, a wonderful experience. And just to be to see all the work that came out of it was really mind blowing. And I just, I feel very honored and I thank you all for like the work that you all have done. And I'm just grateful to self help too for the space that it makes for us to be printers, to like show our work um, and to be a very, like a pretty unique spot in LA that is um, really helpful and, and really helps a lot of us in our artwork and our careers. So I think that's, what I will say at the end, but yeah, and it's great, you know, the, um, I just think it just all around working with Dewey um, was very, he's a really great artist that like, will work with you, will get frustrated, and he's like, just don't take it, like, just play with it, you know, and like, ways that we can get really on these like controlling mechanisms at some point you just have to play and be in the process and as you you let go and you're like open to the process magic happens and that's always beautiful to see what magic happens in that print studio so thank you thank you i was delighted to hear the magic today and to the audience thank you for letting us into your home through this virtual space I invite you to peruse the shopping center at Self Help Graphics for our annual print fair. These prints are available and you can bring them into your home physically and see them every day, be inspired by these wonderful artists, so talented, so articulate, and really pushing the envelope on what is great art. Thank you.